to our sixth and final session of our series, Behind the Headlines. Um, our program today, um, we are the East Asia Resource Center at the University of Washington, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, we are one of seven national coordinating sites of the NCTA, National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. Um, and we are happy to bring to you this series in which we cover different parts of East Asia each week. So far, we have covered the Koreas, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Japan, and today in our final session, we are covering China, uh, and our program will be delivered by Professor David Bachman. Um, before I introduce Professor Bachman, just very quickly, um, we are recording this session today. And uh, after Professor Bachman will be speaking to us, we'll be taking a five minute break, and then we will move on to the Q&A section. And you will be welcome to, you are welcome to put in your questions in the chat. So um, I'm very pleased and we're very happy to have Professor David Bachman back in our program. Um, he had spoken to us a few weeks earlier uh, on our session on Hong Kong. Um, Professor Bachman is the Henry M. Jackson Professor of International Studies at the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. He was chair of the China Studies Program and uh, also the Associate Director of the Jackson School. Uh, he has taught and uh, researched on Chinese domestic and foreign policy, international political economy, Asian politics, international relations, and US-China relations. Uh, earlier this spring, we had Professor Bachman speak to us about the implications of the war in the Ukraine on China. And um, he often uh, has spoken to our teachers and we're very happy to have him back. Um, Professor Bachman, uh, I will hand it off to you now. Thank you, Eureka. Uh, it's good to see you again, all of you. And let me just pull up my slide here. Okay. All right. So, um, and I will confess that um, uh, when I did the Hong Kong talk, that was before school had started, and I could focus in on that. School is now back at the University of Washington, as it is with, I assume, all of you as well. And so this is a more hastily put together kind of talk, which I'm um, not necessarily proud of. But anyway, uh, I'm going to give you a sense of, of some of the issues in China today and what may lie behind them. And so without further Uh, Professor Bakker, it looks like you are unmuting or unmuting. Eureka, do you want to try to unmute him maybe, just in case he's trying to? Okay, that should be good. Okay, sorry about that. You're fine. Okay. Um, okay, so as I did with the Hong Kong talk, um, I... I, um, I want to start with what the headlines are. And uh, um, the headlines for the last year would or so would include what's going on right now. The 20th Party Congress of the Chinese Communist Party is being is taking place in Beijing uh, this week. Uh, and it will ratify Xi Jinping, China's general secretary, president, chairman of the Central Military Commission's total control of the Communist Party. Uh, the, uh, the Party Congress is akin to an American political convention. She gives a speech which is like the platform speech of uh, the platform uh, that US political parties put together. Um, but it, it obviously he's not campaigning for power. He doesn't have to run for election. Uh, and so this is telling the party what it's going to do. It's also telling the Chinese people what the party's priorities will be going forward. 
uh, but it is also a, a, a means by which she will be enshrined as China's most powerful leader. And a new set of secondary leaders will be announced uh, probably on Sunday, this coming Sunday. While this is going on, however, there's a party society disjuncture. And if uh, any of you have had a chance to read the New York Times today, uh, there's a story in the business section and one on the front page too about how the party is, is, is exercising control, being uh, powerful power, uh, and, and thinking things are going ahead while there is this sense in society uh, that there are many social economic issues that are not being addressed. Indeed, party attempts to plow ahead are making some of them worse. Uh, and in that sense, um, where the party seems to be headed and what, what society seems to want or what it seems to need seem to be moving in a very different direction. Uh, China has continued to follow a dynamic, as it calls it, dynamic zero COVID policy. This has created many legacies, uh, including the shutting down of Shanghai, uh, China's biggest economic center for more than two months. This has had spillover effects in terms of the economy, in terms of foreign investment, in terms of the supply chains, as we're familiar with probably, uh, and so on. Related to this, of course, are but not solely caused by dynamic zero COVID are economic issues. Uh, high, very high youth unemployment, by some estimates, 20% of uh, youth are unemployed, stagnant exports, and indeed in a sort of uh, unprecedented development since the late 70s, China did not announce its regularly scheduled third quarter economic statistics, particularly its growth rate for the third quarter, which would have covered from July through September. Um, presumably this is because it would be bad news uh, or much below expectations and below the party's uh, uh, target for the year. And they didn't want this negative news uh, overlapping with uh, the party Congress. Uh, China also suffered through, uh, is suffering through, as we all are, climate change, severe drought uh, in one of the tributaries to the Yangtze River uh, in Chongqing, which I'll show you a picture of later on. Uh, and in the foreign policy side, the headlines were announcing its partnership without limits with Russia in February, and three months, uh, three weeks later, having Russia invade Ukraine, complicating. China's position uh, with regard to Russia and with the US. And we've seen deepening Sino-American conflict. And then a whole bunch of other things have happened which uh, were passing important, uh, but we've probably already forgotten about them since, um, uh, since these other issues are at the forefront. So let me talk a little bit more about each one of these and then talk about what may lie behind them. Okay, the Party Congress. So as I said, the Party Congress is uh, analogous to an American political convention party platform. Here we see in the foreground, Xi Jinping waving to the audience behind, behind him. He's of course the only one without a mask, all, all the delegates all the other people in the presidium or the, the people in charge uh, wearing their masks and, and so on. She spoke for two hours. His speech in English uh, is about 64 single, page, state, single spaced pages uh, of lofty rhetoric um, and uh, very general uh, kinds of party platforms. It speaks to a China in uh, an age of strategic opportunity, uh, worries though about Chinese security and so on. As I said already on Sunday, uh, a new Politburo Standing Committee will be announced. Uh, the Politburo Standing Committee it does not have a definite number of people attached to it. Currently there are seven on it. 
uh, she is the number one person on it. Uh, many of the other members may change, that she may try to push out some of the older folks on the party, uh, uh, the Politburo Standing Committee. There will be new members of the Politburo, which is roughly 25 people, so roughly analogous to the U.S. president and maybe the cabinet and a few other top officials, such as um, the Speaker of the House, the uh, the majority leader in the Senate, the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the um, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and, and so on. And then there'll be a new central committee as well, which would be up and comers to top leadership, who would be roughly analogous to the US Congress. So she gave this major speech uh, outlining past success, future tasks, um, the successes ran to about 10 pages. He noted in passing a few major, pro a few problems, which took all of three paragraphs, and then went on to outline 14 key areas where uh, developments would take place and where China would advance its position. And I'll say more about this later on. Um, she, uh, by this act further consolidates his power. He all but assuredly will gain his third term as the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, which is the most powerful position in China. He is without doubt the most powerful person in China. And the norm up until presumably Sunday has been that general secretaries retire after uh, two terms as general secretary. So by this, he's breaking precedent. Uh, he's complicating uh, arrangements to try to institutionalize power within the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this will create at some point uh, a struggle for succession going forward, all of which means that by holding on to power now, presumably so he can advance uh, a particular agenda that he thinks only he can deliver, he's making potential problems worse in the future. Okay. So with this party state society disjuncture, so she is calling for full speed ahead for the CCP, outlying all these tasks uh, of exercising more party control, making the party uh, more elite, more vanguard. The party has 96 million members, uh, putting it in charge of the military, of business, of everything. Uh, he wants the party to be like it was uh, for his father, and I'll get to that at a later point too, um, and for maybe in the 1950s, a disciplined organization dedicated to advancing China's cause, or as the cause as defined by Xi. Uh, and so it's one where uh, the party is going to lead. But there are clear signs of alienation by many in the population uh, that uh, zero COVID has more or less driven people crazy one way or another. Uh, outbreaks of, of uh, COVID have happened around China Cities have been shut down. Uh, people don't know when they're going to be released. Little or no warning. Uh, there have been many instances of corruption. Uh, the picture here is about people who uh, invested their money in local banks that then basically defrauded them and they're demanding their money back. Uh, and uh, the party is uh, tried to prevent them, the local party tried to prevent them from getting their money back uh, and so on. So all of these examples are, are creating unrest. Um, there are, as I've mentioned already, estimates of 20% of youth, young people, college grads uh, being unemployed. Uh, and Chinese people have gone along with party leadership, it's presumed, uh, because they were promised that life would get better for them as time went along. You side with the party, the party will make life better. And indeed, she is calling for life to be made better uh, in his speech at the party. 
uh, at the party congress, but um, that's running into a reality where uh, the high rapid growth of income seems to be coming to a slowdown, where the uh, chances of, of finding uh, good high paying jobs are going down, where youth competition for jobs is only further intensified, and so on. Uh, and, and these things are weighing on the party. Um, corruption is involved in numerous activities, despite she's claimed to have brought it under control, at least partially over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, more prominently, uh, lots of Chinese have invested in housing uh, where there was something of a housing bubble uh, and where the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, where a number of development companies have gone bankrupt. I'll say more about this in a few minutes. And then again, if you're reading the papers or following news about China, uh, one individual put up a, uh, a sign on, uh, I think it was Sunday, uh, complaining about Xi's seizure of power, demanding an end to, uh, to corruption, more reform, uh, and so on, which given how tight security was in Beijing before the start of the party Congress is, is remarkable in itself. Although one could say, given these other problems, it's somewhat surprising there haven't been more protests, more signs of unhappiness in China. Okay. Uh, let me try to... Okay. So Shanghai with dynamic zero COVID was shut down for two months. Uh, and there's an uptick in cases in Shanghai now, suggesting it might happen again. Uh, various parts of China have been shut down. Lhasa in Tibet was, uh, <clears throat> Cheng, uh, Chengdu was at various times. So a number of major metropolitan areas have been effectively closed down. And you can see what empty streets in Shanghai basically look like and the kinds of things that were going on. So as I said, this, this has meant that large numbers of workers in Shanghai didn't go to work. Uh, that port, the port of Shanghai, one of the world's largest ports, was effectively closed down for two months, meaning that uh, many of the um, the exports churned out by factories in and around Shanghai uh, could not find markets. Uh, the supply chains were fundamentally disrupted by this. Uh, the fact that this has happened and it can continue to happen uh, has led many companies, foreign companies, to rethink uh, whether in fact they should locate production in China. Uh, and there have been uh, several that have begun to move production out of China to Vietnam, uh, to uh, India, to Bangladesh for textiles uh, and elsewhere, all of which have been good for Indonesia and India, Vietnam and, and <clears throat> Bangladesh, uh, but it further compounds employment issues in China lowers the overall economic growth, harms job prospects, at least for uh, people to, uh, to work in assembly lines and so on. Uh, and all of this has led to rapidly slowing growth rates. Again, undermining the sort of sense that uh, if we abide by party rule, are good citizens and obey the party, we will have a more prosperous future. All of this is perhaps coming into question now for the first time in 40 some years. Moreover, it increases a sense of randomness in people's lives that they don't know when there's going to be an outbreak. Break. They don't know when they're going to get locked down. Uh, they don't know how long they will be locked down. They don't know whether they should stock up on food and, and other kinds of things or uh, and all of these things lead to alienation, anger, uh, a restive population if they are sort of given an opportunity to, uh, to show their restiveness. Um, 
And one of the things Xi Jinping wants to do is to make it very difficult for uh, people to demonstrate, to show their unhappiness uh, and so on. Okay. In terms of, of economic issues, uh, one of the biggest problems is um, the housing bubble bursting. So when you buy an apartment or a condo or a co-op, whatever it is in China, you put some money down to begin with. Uh, you you set a, you provide a deposit to a developer who's going to build a complex, and you select your unit, and so on. Uh, and basically, it's uh, almost like a pyramid scheme that there's the largest developer in China, a company by the name of Evergrande, basically was had its production disrupted or the building of, of apartments disrupted by COVID. Uh, it overexpanded. It didn't have the capital it needed to finish apartments. People have been told that um, that they have to put in even more money or they're going to lose the money they put in. Uh, so there's been demonstrations outside of Evergreen's office. Evergrande, sorry, Evergrande has been forced to go into bankruptcy. Other private development companies have gone into bankruptcy. Large numbers of people uh, who thought they had bought apartments were paying um, monthly premiums like mortgages to own the apartments uh, have seemed to have lost their money. So property is a major, a major holder of wealth for the Chinese people. Uh, and many people have effectively lost a great deal of their, their wealth as a result. Moreover, this has affected the overall market or need for housing in China. Uh, people have been uh, much more cautious about investing in new housing. And the selling of land uh, to development companies has been uh, the major source for many local governments' budgets. So if they're not able to sell land, or it's technically leasing land for 75 or 99 years because the state owns all the land in China, uh, but developers are given the right to develop on this land for an extended period. Uh, and, and so uh, no development company is financially strong enough to do this. Um, and so the state is slowly trying to bail out uh, people who bought apartments provide enough capital to finish uh, developments that have already been started, uh, but not necessarily to expand them. But, but city governments are running out of money because uh, no developers are not bidding on new lots of property. Okay, so this property is something like 25% of the economy in terms of building. Uh, in terms of, of uh, construction, in terms of money going into it. Some of this also impacts uh, banks and the we don't have a good sense, and China obscures this, uh, of the credit worthiness of many Chinese banks, particularly local banks. But it's feared that there are, uh, uh, are many that are technically insolvent and will only survive if the state bails them out, which then increases the pressure on the big state-owned banks at the center uh, or on the Chinese government budget. Okay. So I've talked about COVID interrupting uh, the economy as well, but as the rest of the world has sort of put COVID behind it, whether that's a reality or not, they've changed their style of consumption. So for 2020 and 21, people were buying lots of, you know, Pelotons and other sort of gym stuff to work out at home. But since basically we've declared victory and moved on from COVID or so it appears, people are going out, going on vacations. Uh, and so the demand for things that China was building has gone down quite dramatically. Uh, and so this too has affected the Chinese uh, economy. Consequence that this unemployment for many college grads, uh, politically more savvy, uh, urban generally, they're more in a position to potentially cause problems. 
the overeducation, as some have called it, of college youth in developing countries has, has often been a source of political instability in those countries and so on. So as I've mentioned, third quarter economic statistics, which should have been published yesterday, uh, have been indefinitely postponed. In other words, they're bad results. Uh, they would reflect badly on the party Congress, so they've been delayed and they may be massaged so they don't look quite as bad. Uh, so these are some of the issues that affect the, the Chinese economy today. Uh, and again, um, an article in the front page of the New York Times talks about some of these. Okay, so this is, uh, the pictures here are of uh, the river that runs through Chongqing. Uh, Chongqing is Seattle's sister city. It used to be part of Sichuan province. It's now a centrally administered city. Um, it was China's wartime capital uh, during the war with Japan in or World War II. Um, there was a severe drought, and you can see that the river is effectively dried up, which meant no river transportation. It meant also that crops in Sichuan, a major agricultural base, were strongly affected. Uh, it meant transportation was uh, interfered with. It meant water supply became problematic for many. Uh, this is a this is the Jialing River, which is um, a, a tributary of the Yangtze. Uh, the Yangtze was down below reg regular heights, um, so this was a, a big story this summer uh, that that many uh, commented on. Uh, it may speak to uh, China's arguably slowness in addressing climate change issues um, and so on. Um, there was other severe weather in China this summer. It was very hot. That too would have affected agriculture. And like everywhere else, uh, we see accelerating impacts of climate change, uh, increasing losses, economic losses, losses of lives, uh, and so on. Uh, in the PRC. Uh, Xi Jinping does spend some time talking about this in, um, uh, in his speech at the party Congress, uh, but he is reluctant to say that they're going to move rapidly away from a hydrocarbon-based economy. China still gets something like 60 to 65% of its primary energy uh, from coal burning power plants. And Xi's answer there is to think about technology fixes that make coal burn cleaner, and that can purify the air and, and otherwise sequester the carbon released from burning carbon rather than shifting away from a, a carbon-based economy. That said, uh, there are other areas where China is making rapid progress in terms of electronic ve electric vehicles. Uh, it, it remains the biggest producer of solar panels in the world. Uh, and so on. Okay, in terms of foreign policy, uh, China signed a partnership without limits with uh, Russia uh, at the onset of the Winter Olympics in Beijing in February. Russia then, of course, invaded Ukraine three weeks later. Uh, and since that time, uh, China has had to balance very carefully uh, its relations with Russia. Uh, otherwise, the US threatened severe sanctions. And I gave a talk about that in spring, and I'm not going to say that much new about this or, or that much more about this. Um, clearly, China showed the limits to that partnership. Uh, given the pressure the U.S. put on China not to supply um, uh, weapons to the PRC, the threats that we think the Biden administration made uh, to, uh, shall we say, discourage uh, China from providing more assistance to Russia. The U.S. has, has not objected, it appears, uh, to the buying of uh, China, Russian oil and gas. But given the slowdown of the Chinese economy, China doesn't need as much as it's importing and it, its companies are reselling that oil and gas to Europe and elsewhere. Uh, China's also been buying 
buying Russian agricultural products as their own harvest has been affected by the bad weather. It appears that, uh, although we don't have definitive knowledge about this, that, uh, that China is quite concerned about the, the nuclear threats that Putin has been hinting at towards Ukraine and others, uh, that we think that China would be very happy if the war came to an end very quickly. And given that Russia has supplied a, a fair number of pieces of equipment to the Chinese military, that the Chinese military and the Russian military have uh, often done military exercises together, that obviously because the US military and the Chinese military uh, don't have uh, cooperative engagements with each other, China's military, which hasn't functioned in a major conflict since 1979, um, China's sense of what a modern military looks like is the Russian military. Uh, and they're shocked by the performance of the poor performance of the Russian military, the uh, success that Western military equipment uh, has enabled the Ukrainian military to uh, achieve, uh, and the relative uh, weaknesses of Russia's equipment. All of these mean that uh, China if it was open to it, should be thinking about uh, whether it wants this uh, partnership without limits to continue. In terms of China and the US, uh, China and the US increasingly see each other as competitive or in hegemonic terms. So the Biden administration released its national security strategy 10 days ago or so, maybe two weeks ago, where it labeled China the number one challenge to the US position in the world, uh, that the Biden administration has also introduced recently very significant restrictions on the sale of and use of advanced semiconductor technology for China forcing China to uh, develop a complete semiconductor production line in very advanced areas. The United States does not have a complete semiconductor production line or production chain. We rely on others to fill in parts of that. Uh, there is an aspiration for the US to have that, uh, but um, we rely on Taiwan and Korea and the Netherlands and many other countries to, uh, to supply parts of the production chain that allows the United States to have this. So we're, we're saying to China, you have to develop all these techniques that took decades to develop. Uh, you have to throw money at the problem. We're restricting people who have access to US patents and technologies in these areas from working with China, all of which will greatly hinder uh, many aspects of the Chinese economy, the Chinese military, uh, China's uh, pursuit of, of advanced technology in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, fifth and sixth generation uh, cell phone communication, uh, other advanced uses, and so on. And um, as I've already noted, uh, US national security strategy identifies China as the number one challenge. Uh, and increasingly, Taiwan is becoming a flashpoint. And I'm sure those of you who heard that Taiwan talk heard about it, uh, you'll remember that Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, uh, went to Taiwan in, uh, in August. This has provoked a series of, of Chinese military exercises, challenges, threats to Taiwan. Uh, this also has led to increasing congressional support and. Uh, and actions to support Taiwan. Uh, um, the US and Taiwan are, are improving their military cooperation. Uh, she has made it clear that he doesn't want US interference. The United States has made it clear that it doesn't want China to use force. She wants Taiwan to be part of the PRC nationalist um, public feeling in China also wants Taiwan to be back in the PRC. Um, but that's not, you know, no one on Taiwan or almost no one in 
I want, uh, wants to, to rejoin the PRC, particularly after the developments in Hong Kong and China saying that only patriots can govern Hong Kong. Presumably a similar kind of a policy would, would be in place for Taiwan. Only people who loyal to the PRC could, uh, could rule Taiwan, which effectively means puppets of the PRC. So Taiwan is increasingly a flashpoint. Other, rich, other foreign policy developments, there have been something of a retreat from the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, many of the countries in the developing world that took out belt and loan projects are having trouble repaying them. Uh, that uh, this is redounding negatively to uh, to uh, banks uh, in China that, that put out the loans. Uh, there's a real danger that many of these projects will go into default or that China will have to renegotiate the terms of the loans and so on. Uh, and so there's been a lot less uh, reference to Belt and Road in Xi's, as I said, 64-page speech. It was mentioned twice. Um, that's been somewhat replaced by what she proposed at the UN last September, the Global Development Initiative, which is somewhat less China-centric. Uh, it talks about providing more aid to the Global South. Uh, and it, it's less activist than Belt and Road has been. So as I said, the, this has created debt issues for BRI countries, uh, many of them in Africa, but Pakistan uh, has also, uh, Sri Lanka uh, have also had real problems with the debt uh, that was added onto by Belt and Road projects. And Chinese banks are reluctant to refinance or to write off the debts, uh, but ultimately they may have to. That said, uh, China continues to play to the global south. Its foreign policy is more geared to the global south. It is trying to, to build constituencies uh, in the developing world so that it has a majority in the UN, in many international organizations, uh, and where it can increasingly be a rule setter in major international organizations. Uh, and given that not only is China continuing with some Belt and Road projects, but it's providing many kinds of, of opportunities for people in the Global South, uh, educating many in China's colleges, providing tours for media people in uh, in these countries to come to China and be feted and uh, and see the best sides of China and go back and uh, and spread the word about how successful China is um, and uh, providing media to uh, television networks and so on, cable networks in the global south, providing uh, 4G, if not 5G phone networks, all of which build popular support for China in Africa uh, in a more mixed picture in Latin America and other parts of Asia. China uses or is what people have called sharp power to try to counter U.S. alliance building behavior. So the United States has intensified its cooperation with Japan with regard to Taiwan and Asia Pacific with Australia. Uh, Britain has talked about taking a stronger stance against China in Asia. Uh, U.S. is encouraging the EU and NATO to be more involved. Uh, and so China is trying to counter this by what's called sharp power, threatening economic sanctions, making life difficult for uh, European companies, for example, or Japanese companies in the China market and so on. Uh, and probably it's fair to say they're fighting each other to a, to a draw at this point. And China continues to follow its assertive, or as some call it, wolf warrior diplomacy or foreign policy. The picture on the bottom here, uh, there was a protester outside the Chinese consulate in Manchester, England, uh, who had a sign up that had a caricature of Xi Jinping uh, wearing a crown and, um, uh, and, and a pair of underpants. 
uh, protesting outside the Chinese consulate general. And a number of uh, uh, consulate officials, including the consulate general, came out. And those are the people more or less uh, with the masks on in this picture, came out of the consulate, dragged the person inside and beat them before British police and, and others managed to get him out. Uh, and this is indicative, or per, probably an extreme version of some of this assertive diplomacy, but emblematic of China uh, willing to sort of do anything to defend China's dignity in ways that redound against China, at least in places like the UK and so on. Okay. Okay. So in terms of et cetera, um, Oops, sorry. Um, so we have uh, continuing sharp declines in Bur oh, I'm sorry, I'm hitting too many things with my scrolling here. Uh, and unfortunately, something is covering up my screen, so I can't see my top line here, but there are continuing sharp declines in birth. So China's population by outside estimates has begun to shrink. This has economic implications. Indeed, over the last three years, we've gone down from more than 20.5 million births a year down to about 10.5 million births a year. Um, and so uh, this will have implications for, uh, for <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for schools, for employment in schools, for uh, youth-oriented activities, and so on. There was, was a plane crash. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the top line was Winter Olympics. Oh, right. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we may forget that the Winter Olympics were held in Beijing in, uh, in February, uh, and they were a typical sort of PRC type of show. There weren't foreign tourists because of COVID and, and China's quarantine and, and lockdown. Uh, so that uh, <clears throat> as a result of that, um, it didn't have the kind of, of, of promotional power that might have been the case of, of earlier or other Olympics. But nonetheless, China put on a show for the world that was generally well received and, and scored some minor propaganda points for it. There was a plane crash uh, in, um, in May, where apparently either the pilot or the co-pilot uh, deliberately crashed the plane uh, and killed 127 people in that crash. China has not explained what was behind that, uh, but it has cleared uh, Boeing from any responsibility for it. Uh, and so what happened and why this happened, uh, whether it was an individual act of, of desperation or madness or depression, we'll perhaps never know. But it is perhaps speaking to this theme of alienation in society uh, that I've mentioned throughout parts of this talk. There's been a crackdown on big private information communications and technology companies, Alibaba, Tencent, and some of the others, um, great, gaining greater control by having a hand-picked successor to lead Hong Kong. I've talked about that in the Hong Kong talk, um, but, but Hong Kong from the PRC perspective is now being well-managed uh, and under the control ultimately of the central government, but acting through um, uh, locally uh, anointed leaders in Hong Kong. Um, we've had the various maneuvers, threats towards Taiwan uh, that are more or less now part of the background noise that we get, not background noise for the people in Taiwan. Uh, and they play into uh, growing US support for Taiwan and so on. We've had continuing <laughs> repression in Xinjiang, uh, a UN Human Rights Commission report that, uh, that, um, that called China out on this, and so on. And you probably heard that in the Xinjiang lecture if you've been going to all of these. So 
I mean, many, many things happening, uh, but to get lost in the shuttle perhaps of, of the daily news that's coming out that fits into this broader pattern. So what's behind the headline? Um, she thinks things are great. Western observers see severe problems. How do we explain this disjuncture between the Chinese position uh, and, or the official party position and Western observers? So we could argue that maybe she is only being told what he wants to hear, somewhat like Putin, uh, presumably uh, uh, off in his own world, uh, subordinates fearful to provide uh, bad news and other kinds of, of things that would sort of cause a need for a rethink. Um, we have a sense uh, the Western observers of the Chinese political system have a sense that, yeah, maybe he does only listen to a few, a small number of people, uh, and that could be a very severe problem. That that hubris, overconfidence, uh, all of these things may be playing into what's going on. Uh, another issue is that outside observers are applying Western frameworks to China that may not fit China's actual conditions. So we think, uh, based on Western experience, that the way to create an innovative society is to give lots of freedom of thought to inventors, innovators, entrepreneurs, and others, uh, that you can't simply cut certain areas of discussion off and expect people to be innovative in politically approved kinds of areas. We think that markets and the kind of hierarchical authoritarian regimes uh, that China has uh, are in contradiction uh, and so on. Maybe that's our preconceptions and China doesn't follow those Western ideals or Western experiences. And maybe she and the CCP and Western observers are looking at different things or they're thinking about short-term versus long-term. Uh, all of these are possible elements of why the party seems to be having uh, a different view of things uh, than do many Western observers. Okay, so how we would explain what's happened over the last year or so and, and for a longer period. So one easy way and sort of uh, two-bit psychoanalyzing, which you see in the press and indeed in, in academic writings about Xi as well, is that uh, this need for control that Xi expresses in almost all of his speeches, in his actions, in his, uh, his policy direction and so on, are based on his uh, life experience. That he was the son of a top-ranking official who was purged in 1962. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, his family was attacked. He lived on the streets of Beijing for a number of years, then was sent down to uh, live in a poor rural part of northern Shanxi province um, that we think or we can impute that out of this experience, he, from the Cultural Revolution, his life experience, he, he has absorbed a fear of chaos, a fear of disorder. Uh, and out of this, his dominant political lesson or experience out of his life is the need for an overriding sense of, of control that the party and maybe even she personally has to supervise and control everything in China. And this is necessary to prevent COVID and the fear, you know, there are legitimate reasons, at least there were, why China took a zero COVID strategy. If COVID had broken out in the way that it did in the US, it would have overwhelmed the Chinese medical system. Uh, but China has yet to develop a very successful mRNA uh, vaccine. It's refused to import Western mRNA vaccines. Uh, there's still the danger that this would overwhelm uh, the 
hospital and the medical system. So there's a reason to do it. But this has come at the cost of economic losses, of cutting China off uh, from the outside world in many practical respects, and so on. The need to control large private enterprises for fear that uh, people like Jack Ma, the owner of of ten cent or of, of Alibaba, sorry, uh, were becoming too popular and too powerful, that the power of large fortunes was corrupting the party, and so on. Uh, and so basically rein them in. The party had to control corruption, even though much of the corruption was found within the party itself. The answer was control rather than opening up the party to criticism uh, of a freer press that was given some uh, license to expose corruption and so on. Uh, the party control of the military to ensure that it didn't become a challenge to the party's power. Uh, and that factions that weren't loyal to Xi Jinping wouldn't be uh, in important positions. Control of minorities uh, by forcing them to assimilate to ethnic Chinese, Han Chinese norms. Control to crack down on crime through surveillance and, and social uh, controls, uh, cameras everywhere. Uh, filtering this through artificial intelligence and otherwise uh, trying to use constant surveillance as a means of, of controlling human behaviors and so on. Okay. Um, so um, again, this leads to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sorry. Um, you know, this, this runs up like this need for control is often seen as countering to what the conventional wisdom suggests. So zero COVID harms the economy. Uh, it increasingly isolates China. And that may be something that she isn't all that unhappy about uh, with limited numbers of foreigners coming to China. But wealthier, more influential Chinese are upset about limitations on their travel abroad. Uh, it undermines supply chains emanating from China. It makes them potentially unreliable, forcing others to move their supply chains and so on. Um, we have a record over the last 40 some years that the private sector has been the most dynamic sector of the economy, uh, the most innovative, the, the one that's created the most jobs. Um, but we fear that more party leadership and priority uh, for over for state owned enterprises will harm growth, job creation, innovation, and so on. So there's a real trade off here, at least by the way that we understand these things in the West. Okay. So um, the party. She will be anointed party leader. Uh, he's you know, not likely to be, uh, a new party leadership will be announced uh, when the party leadership, the party Congress concludes. Uh, she is not likely to step down as leader, uh, uh, follow precedent. Uh, he will be the most powerful leader uh, by far in China by a very substantial margin. He will control the agenda to the extent that the party controls the agenda as opposed to responding to events uh, happening in the environment outside the party. But this sort of his exercise of power and control over the party may also create additional problems uh, down the road that control controlling too much. So this may increase the subterranean struggle for power among younger officials uh, vying to this uh, vying to be the successor when she ultimately uh, steps down or dies or whatever. He's not likely to name a successor uh, at the close of the conference. Those who fear he will hold on to power too long and thus they will miss uh, their chances to compete for leadership. Uh, will also be a potentially silent opposition. Uh, those who are a little younger than Xi, but who are being sort of aged out of the leadership will resent Xi's holding on to power. More 
Over, she seems to be building a personality cult. Uh, um, there was, seems to be one emerging around him, uh, which given his response to the cultural revolution seems a bit ironic, given that it, it, that it seems to generate more power for she to run rampant within the system uh, and create possible disorder as Mao did during the cultural revolution. Uh, and finally, it's not clear that the types of control associated with Xi lead to the kind of dynamic environment that is presumed necessary to raise Chinese technology to the next level, and indeed, which is one of the sort of hallmarks of his speech to the party Congress. Okay. So in conclusion, um, there are some who believe that as a result of the economic and social problems in China, that China's relative power uh, internationally has peaked. And this makes China, in their view, more dangerous, more likely to engage in international conflict, may make them more risk uh, uh, tolerant, may make China more inclined to try to seize Taiwan in the next five to 10 years or so. President Biden and his national security strategy has seen the 2020s as a decisive decade to deal with both great power rivalry, China and Russia, and global issues like climate change and others. That said, uh, in other words, from both of these things, we can see uh, a, a kind of quite dangerous coming seven or eight years. That said, as I noted in passing a minute ago, Western observers have been noting the contradiction between a market-oriented economy and China's authoritarian political system since at least the early 1980s. That contradiction hasn't proven insol insolvable or irresolvable yet. What, what makes this time different? Why, sh why should it now? That said, I'll just close by saying China is is going to face extremely difficult challenges in the years ahead. And whether the party and Xi Jinping are well equipped to tolerate these kinds of problems, to think of good kinds of solutions, to manage the situation well, is a very open question. And with that, I'll just turn to uh, a number of reading suggestions for you. Um, the first one uh, is uh, John Fitzgerald, Cadre Country. Uh, sort of an overview of, of where China is uh, today, uh, of uh, the partyization of all of China. Um, Fitzgerald was uh, is a noted historian, but he was also the head of the Ford Foundation's Beijing office for a number of years. So he's very well connected to what's going on in China. Scott Rosell and Natalie Hell's book, Invisible China, is about the neglect of the countryside, the kinds of human capital problems that exist in the Chinese countryside, where most of the population growth in China is taking place, and where schooling, health facilities, uh, basic kinds of provision of vitamins, of eyeglasses that would enable you to develop better human capital in the countryside just aren't present. Hal Brands and Michael Beckley's Danger Zone, it, it refers to that uh, first point on the previous slide about those who predict that China's uh, power has peaked uh, and therefore uh, China's more dangerous. They're principal advocates of this, uh, leading public intellectuals on these kinds of U.S. foreign policy issues confronting China. Susan Shirk's overreach is about how China's sort of overconfidence is, is holding back its rise and Andrew Collier's book, China's Technology War, is about uh, reigning in of, of Alibaba, Tencent, and others. And with that, I will stop sharing the screen. Uh, and it's time, I guess, for our break. Yes, it is. Thank you, Professor Bachman. Uh, right